Jose is a research scientist at Google Research. His research interest lies at the intersection of generalization and optimization, with emphasis on deep learning. Prior to joining Google in 2016, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the computer science and artificial intelligence lab at MIT. While uh, when he was at was at MIT, he was also uh, he collaborated with uh, Professor Fojo uh, and uh, published a paper in NIPS 2015. Uh, he obtained his PhD in computer science from the computer, uh, University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, and he's an uh, active member of the machine learning community, serving as a uh, area chair of ICML and uh, Europe and ICR. Thanks, everyone. Uh, for attending my talk. Today I'll be talking about self-training and self-distillation and why they can improve generalization. This is joint work with my collaborators, Mehdad Farsh uh, Sabar from DeepMind and Peter Bartlett from Google Research and also UC Berkeley. Uh, so I was asked by the organizers to keep this talk uh, high level. As a result of that, I'll skip some of the details during the talk, but I wanted to let you know that um, all the details are available in this preprint, which I share on the screen. Um, so you can find it on archive and all the details are there. All right, so let me first start with self-training. So it's actually a quite old technique used in unsupervised and semi-supervised learning in machine learning. So um, let me first give you an example in case of uh, semi-supervised. Suppose you have some labeled data and some unlabeled data. What they do is that they first train a model on the labeled data. You get a model and then use that model to make predictions on the unlabeled data. So at this point, your unlabeled data have some labels attached to it. These are not real labels. It's generated by the model, predicted by the model. That's why People sometimes call it pseudo labels, but now you can train another classifier on the full set, including these pseudo labels and you know the original label set, and get a second classifier. And then the second classifier is now like doing a well job. Uh, you can also use this in a fully unsupervised uh, setting. The idea is um, since all the data is unlabeled in this setting, you need to have access to some other data set that is some, somewhat similar or it, it has some commonality with your data. So you train a classifier on that uh, data which, which is labeled and you get a classifier, then you take that classifier, apply it to your unlabeled data and um, again, generate pseudo labels for them and use those pseudo labels now to train a model uh, using that in a supervised fashion. And there are slight uh, tweaks and variations of this whole concept. For example, in the unsupervised case, sometimes people not like use all the uh, unlabeled uh, data that uh, now have pseudo labels. They only use a portion that the model is more confident, uh, introduce that into the next round of training. And once they get their second model, then again, they generate pseudo labels on the remaining unlabeled data and again, only take a portion of more confident uh, uh, subset. And, you know, but the overall idea is this sort of self-training that you have a model that learns from its own predictions. Now, there is um, a more restricted version of this, more special case of this, which uh, in deep learning community, people call it self-distillation. So it's now used in a completely supervised uh, setup. So, the, the idea is as the following. I'm just um, illustrating the figure on the top. So we have some input output pairs, x0, y0. We train a model, we get a classifier, or if it's regression, we get some uh, continuous predictions, f0. And what we do is now we, pre uh, we pretend these predictions are new target values. So we replace labels with those while maintaining the inputs the same. And then this creates a second data set, right? We train the model from, from scratch with this new data, get a second model. And we can repeat this process because this gives its own prediction. Again, you can treat these predictions as the next label. What people in deep learning community observed 
uh, and you see one reference here, born again neural networks was one of the main references showing this, uh, was that the test performance of these models actually can improve over this iteration. And that's very, in my opinion, at the first glance, it was very weird and surprising because there is no external information coming from anywhere. It's the same network architecture. It's the same training procedure uh, that I'm using in this block. And it's the same data set. It, at least the input part is the same. And somehow this internal loop is able to you know, uh, generate models that perform better. And that was, at the first glance, again, it was surprising to me why this happens. Uh, but uh, once we studied this problem more closely, we realized that actually this is a more profound phenomenon. It's not unique to deep learning, although we should be thankful to the deep learning community because they, in, to the best of my knowledge, they first observed this. At, the, at least the name self-facilitation is exactly attached to deep learning community when they observe this. But now we know that this also happens uh, in more uh, basic regression scenarios, like even simpler setups. You don't need the, the fancy deep learning uh, for, for observing this phenomenon. And uh, actually, I will use this regression, simple regression setup today to present uh, my analysis, which explain what's, what's happening, why self-isolation can improve generalization. And uh, the uh, reason is obvious because now we have a problem that is uh, math mathematically easier to analyze and we can you know, give concrete answers to some of the questions about this phenomenon. So in this slide, you see the regression setup. Uh, what we do is to, given a training set where I show as x, k, y, k, the input output pairs, you have capital K of these points, and I'm using simple L2 loss. Um, I'm just demanding the total loss to be smaller than some tolerance epsilon. For, uh, for this setup, of course, there are many functions in the function space that can uh, you know, uh, satisfy either completely pass through this point or pass close by this point to maintain this epsilon uh, accuracy. Uh, so in order to single out the solutions that we care about, we have to use uh, regularization, which basically is our bias introduced into this regression, which, which solutions we prefer. And here you see a specific form of the regularization that I'm using. Um, I, I think because of the broad audience, if you haven't seen this sort of regularization, it may look a little bit complex, uh, but you, you really don't need to worry about it because I have some slides um, soon that will at least provide some intuition what's going on with this form of regularizer. For now, just think of it as a regularizer. Takes a function, outputs a number, and this number basically assigns some sort of complexity to this function or some sort of smoothness of f. So uh, we can use a Lagrange multiplier, very straightforward, to convert this into an unconstrained optimization. So this will be what I will focus on. It's easier to present. Uh, we have this coefficient c, which you know builds the trade-off between uh, fitting accuracy and regularization. And uh, actually, this form of uh, regression problem is very well studied in machine learning literature. In fact, Tommy uh, has been a pioneer in this area from the machine learning perspective. Uh, he and Federico Girosi uh, in the 90s published a series of interesting papers on problems of this sort and uh, I think those are great references if anybody is interested to learn more about some of the detailed aspects of you know how this regularization framework works these are great papers here I just have one of them uh, with more than 4,000 4, citations as an example okay so I promise that I provide some intuition about what this regularization doing and I think eigen decomposition will be a very uh, a very uh, appropriate tool for uh, for achieving that goal. So here, the, regulariz uh, the regularization was uh, characterized by a kernel u in the earlier slide. You can think of this as a linear operator that this integral u times function as a linear operator that you know takes a function and returns a function, right? Because the the, the dummy variable x tag eliminates and you get another function in place. So uh, 
in the same uh, in a very like similar way that we think about uh, matrices and vectors and matrices having eigenvectors we can have uh, operators similar to matrices and functions similar to vectors and then for matrices or in this case operators we can have um, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues and they basically satisfy a very similar property so if phi i is an eigenfunction of this operator it means that when i apply it to this linear operator i get the same function phi i times a constant which is the the eigenvalue of this eigenvector now without loss of generality i can represent my f using this uh this basis because this this gives me a complete orthonormal basis so now uh, my goal is to just you know identify the coefficients ai uh, uh, the bases are given by the regularizer to to fit my uh, to find my solution so now this helps me to reduce the variational problem that you saw uh, earlier to something uh that um Okay, I just have a quick question because there is this uh, portion that's blocking part of the formula. Is it just on my screen or you also have it? Um, maybe I can- uh, We see the full thing. Oh, you see the oh, full thing. Okay. Great, great. So yeah, what happens is that for the regularization, now it greatly simplifies. Uh, you can see that the regularization part is now sum of squared of this coefficient, although each coefficient is uh, penalized by this eigenvalue thing, right? So essentially it says, okay, if uh, my regularization is like introducing some eigenvectors so that you can, or eigenfunctions, so that you can build your solution by a weighted sum of those. Uh, I also assign a cost for you to pick each of these uh, eigenfunctions. And the, the cost is determined by, by this operator. So here's a very uh, simple illustrative example. Suppose I'm uh, considering functions uh, that map the interval of zero to one to real numbers. And suppose my regularization is just penalizing the second order derivative of my function over the entire uh, domain of zero to one. So I square it and uh, integrate it. Of course, because I introduced this uh, differential uh, operator, I also need to talk about what happens at the boundaries but the really those are the details uh, you don't need to worry about those um okay so i just need to get my parrot getting upset um so he will be listening throughout the talk as well um so now for this operator for this second order derivative uh, i have plotted the eigenfunctions so the blue one is the first eigenfunction then you have orange uh green and red and then on the right, you see the eigenvalues. So you can see that the red one is actually the largest. And the blue one is, um, I think if you read the scales, the blue ones may be less than 10, while the larger one, uh, the, the red one is about 120. So it means that if I want to use the red one to contribute to my solution, I have to pay the cost of like 120 times more than using the, the earlier one. So that's how it biases us to, you know, use some uh, bases versus others. All right, now this is a key intuition. We will use it across, across the talk. Uh, and one more thing I should say before we move on is that this uh, kind of regularization problem that we are studying has a closed form solution. Again, the details, how we get this closed form are not uh, like crucial for this talk. I can just present the, the final form. But if you're interested, you can either refer to our paper or if you want more details, as I said, Tommy has a, a series of papers uh, on this, which you can refer to. But what, what uh, like if I just want to give you the gist of it, so associated with this uh, kernel, a regular kernel of the regularization operator, uh, we can identify a, uh, another uh, like kernel, which is called Green's function. And it satisfies the, this identity that you see, just uh, you know, applying that to, the, to our operator should produce the delta function. So uh, once you have the Green's function, then you need to form two uh, quantities, uh, one a matrix, uh, capital G, and one vector, small g. So the capital G is just taking all pairs of uh, training points, evaluate them with this Green's function. Uh, that's why you get a matrix. 
The other one uses Green's function, but only use one argument uh, for training points. The other argument is free. So you get a vector, but each component is now a function of x. And now if you put these uh, matrices and your labels y, I also arrange all, all the labels uh, as a vertical, uh, as a column vector, then I can express my solution in this form. So this is a very well-known result. I don't need to uh, like uh, emphasize too much. We just take it as granted. Uh, but we will use this form for, uh, for our analysis. Okay. Now, again, before we move on up to this point, I want to make some connections uh, that are uh, interesting and important. One of them is that you can, you can clearly see there is a close connection here between this kind of regularization problem and the uh, kernel regression problem. Essentially, G is a kernel function. So you can think of this G as kernel in the sense of, you know, kernels that we use in SVN. So it's the same thing. So this is essentially like this regularization problem can be written equivalently as a kernel regression problem. So that's one point. And now that we see this as a kernel regression problem, it provides another connection, interesting connection, and that's to uh, wide neural networks, which operate in NTK, neural tangent kernel regime, because for these uh, neural networks, it's been shown that the problem uh, moves down to just a kernel regression. Uh, so all the bias, the fancy biases you have in a deep architecture, like the convolution, pooling, hierarchical representation, all of that is at the end of the day encoded into a single function, and that's a kernel function for the case of like white neural networks. So uh, we will get back to these intuitions. Okay. Now that we have the regression problem set up, let's uh, talk about self-distillation. So again, some notation here, as I said, uh, the vector y is just stacking all the training uh, scalar uh, points y. I have k training points, so I have y1 to yk. And suppose also, if I have a model train on this data, I get predictions, I can again, form a vector of predictions over the training points, right, from x1 to xk. So this is the, the bold F. All right, so now as I showed earlier, the solution form for this regression has this form. So for the first round F0, um, the solution has this form as you see, where Y0 is the initial ground truth label. Now what we do in self distillation is now pretending that this F0 is going to be a label. So we set our next round of uh, the labels for the next round, which I denote by y1, equal to f0. And then I write the formula for f1, which is exactly the same because we are not changing anything other than changing the label from y0 to y1. And then I replace the definition of y1. So you can actually keep repeating this and see that at the end, after t steps, your solution actually evolves according to this uh, formula at the bottom. The important part is that product. So you get um, the product of uh, t plus one terms. Uh, everything is the same except the, the coefficient, the regularization coefficient ci, which varies in each uh, round of self distillation. So at the first glance, this may look a uh, very simple form. It's like a power iteration, but actually it's not a conventional power iteration. Why? Because in power iteration, this thing, this linear operator, so I'm basically grouping uh, everything after this pi as an operator. So the matrix or the operator A is G times this uh, parenthesis that's inverted. Take that as a linear operator. So we are uh, applying this linear operator over and over to Y0, uh, T times. Uh, but this is not really a standard power iteration because this linear operator is changing dynamically over time because it depends on this um, like iteration dependent uh, coefficient ci. And it, this actually uh, greatly complicates the analysis because this ci itself has you know very complicated dependency of the norm of the solution in the previous round and um, creates a messy recurrence relationship which doesn't have a closed form. But you know in the main paper we um, we basically provide bounds here and there to uh, get control over this thing. But for the sake of this talk, you can just uh, pretend that this uh, coefficient CT is constant over time. 
uh, because it still enables us to make our point, although it's not exactly uh, correct, uh, but it's enough for making the point. And as I said, the, the full exposition is in the paper. Okay, so if this coefficient is constant, it doesn't change over time. Now things greatly simplify because now I can say, okay, this, this product thing inside this pi is just essentially raising the same thing to power t plus one, right? And that's what I'm doing. And on top of that, I can just use eigen decomposition of the matrix G because everything you see is either G or identity matrix or some matrix inversion and none of these changes the eigenvectors. So I can push the eigenvectors out and write the thing, the meat that is uh, in the middle just in terms of diagonals. Okay, now let's look at this diagonal. Now things are very clear now. You can see that as T goes larger and larger, uh, what happens is that these smaller components of this diagonal shrink faster and faster to the point that maybe after like um, some iterations, you can completely consider the small, initially small ones as negligible now because they shrunk so much relative to you know, the magnitude of the larger values that you can actually consider them as non-existent. So as actually T goes to infinity, all these uh, components will die, become like super negligible relative to the largest one. And so you can, you can think of it as only having like one non-zero component on, on the um, diagonals, everything else as zero. And here I'm not talking about absolute numbers, absolute value numbers. I'm talking about the relative uh, scale of this thing. So um, compared to the largest one, the smaller ones are becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, so that's when t goes to infinity, you end up with one significant uh, component. But of course, uh, during this path, as you increase t, uh, you get gradual you know, elimination or um, weakening of these small uh, values. So it kind of like progressively sparsifies this diagonal matrix. Okay, so why this is important because this is exactly how it's imposing this capacity control that uh, can improve generalization. Here I just do a simple renaming to I think make it slightly more clear. Uh, let's name this rotated labels um, y0 times uh, the eigenvector which is a rotation matrix just call it z0. These are the labels and the solution on the left hand side of z0 doesn't depend on labels at all, except possibly through uh, scalar C, but none of the vectors or matrices depend on labels. So this is saying that um, all the information at this end in the vector form uh, of the labels goes into this Z0. And now when this middle term is very sparse, it means that uh, I'm only allowed to use a few number of these uh, rotated labels to construct my solution. So Initially, I didn't have this, uh, this restriction, right? As, as it's sparse of a more and more, I'm losing my degrees of freedom to make use of more points in my representation. So this is exactly how the capacity of this model is being controlled. And the sparsity level of this matrix is um, basically determin uh, determining the effective number of basis function that you're using to represent your solution. Okay. So actually, you can use this sparsity pattern to even uh, come up with generalization guarantees. Because I want to keep the talk high level, I will not get into the details of this part. But uh, the high level idea is that you can bound the so-called Rademacher complexity, which is a complexity measure of uh, function uh, classes, of, of models of this type, depending on their sp sparsity level. And then once you have a bound on the Rademacher complexity, then you can use standard uh, generalization bounds or standard theorems that uh, based on a bound on Rademacher complexity, you can get a generalization bound. All right, so now let's revisit our toy example that I showed earlier, although this time we want to study it uh, within the self distillation loop, see what happens there. So the first part of this slide is the same as before. We, we are penalizing the second order derivative. I will have the same boundary condition. But here, I also provided the analytical form of the Green's function, although you really don't need to have it. Like uh, It's just for completeness of the presentation. You don't need to know how to derive um, the Green's function from the regularization operator. 
for, for the kind of results we present in the stock, but I have it just for completeness. Okay. So for this example, uh, the first figure A is showing uh, just the shape of the Green's function. And uh, the middle figure is showing our um, setup, regression setup. So the orange curve in the middle is the sinusoid that we are trying to fit. It's, it's like the underlying ground truth function uh, that we don't see. Instead, we see some noisy samples from this function. And those noisy samples are shown by these small blue dots. I hope you can see them. Uh, in, it's still in the middle figure I'm talking. Um, I have 11 of those points, if I'm not mistaken. And the goal is to you know, use these points to recover a function that's as close as possible to the sinusoid. All right. Uh, so if you just go ahead with the first round of training, you get this blue curve in the middle which is clearly overfitting to the data, right? You don't get anything uh, close to the sinusoid. But on the right, I'm showing what happens if you do additional rounds of training by just taking the predictions of this uh, original training and you know doing another round of training and repeating this loop. So you can see that the functions, you go from blue to orange to uh, green and eventually red are becoming smoother and smoother. Actually, I think the orange one, which is just uh, one round of self facilitation is already very close uh, to, to a sinusoid, so you can stop there. But one thing you can see is that the further rounds um, doing additional smoothing plus uh, shrinking the size of the function. So you see that the function is becoming also uh, closer to zero. So this is basically confirming uh, what uh, we were discussing within a toy example. All right, now let's look at these uh, diagonal components also, how they evolve. So because we have uh, 11 uh, training points in this example, the matrix that we have, it's K by K, if you remember the notation, so it's 11 by 11, it's diagonal, so we have only 11 components. Initially, these components are distributed as shown on the left, so you have some larger ones, some smaller ones, but after one round of self distillation you see that the smaller ones quickly shrink. And only the larger ones are significant relative to others. And if you keep doing this, of course, uh, this process exaggerates. And at the end, uh, I think you can fairly say it's only two or three uh, bases that remain for you to represent your function. So um, one thing that's Perhaps you saw in the figure, but I didn't explain much, was that as you increase the self isolation rounds, because it, as we showed, it amplifies this regularization effect, it shrinks the function also, like the value of the function is shrinking towards zero. And at some point, uh, the process will collapse. You will just get zero function, and from that point on, there's no more self isolation Just, you know, it's a fixed point. You just produce the zero function. Uh, from that point on. And uh, the reason that this happens is uh, very obvious because the labels, because the predictions are shrinking, right? Uh, at some point, you can easily satisfy the error tolerance uh, being as smaller than epsilon because the labels are very small, so you can uh, choose very small functions. And at this point, zero function may even be within your error tolerance. So zero function is a solution, and it also minimizes your regularization. So at, at that point, your solution, the solution that minimizes the regularization and still valid for your constraint is zero function. So you get zero function, and that's collapse, and then nothing interesting going on after. But uh, actually, we can uh, bound the number of rounds that you can get meaningful self distillation before the solution collapses. So again, uh, the derivation I won't, I will not enter. I'll just presenting the end result. Uh, so K is the number of examples. Epsilon is your uh, training error, like in each training round, at what point I stop training uh, based on the training error reaching epsilon. And kappa is the condition number of your uh, gram matrix that you had from the uh, kernel, like the, the, the big matrix G, uh, the condition number of that. So, um, that is uh, that is one I think interesting uh, result that we can show. First of all, it collapses, and second, we can bound the number of meaningful iterations. Another thing is the advantage of having small epsilon, which allows these models to move near interpolation regions. So that means the models are uh, 
attaining a very close uh, error to zero, but not perfect to zero. So uh, we can actually show that by reducing epsilon, uh, the error tolerance, you can increase the sparsity level of the solution that you ultimately get after like uh, repeating this for whatever number of iterations that we have here that guarantees no, no collapse. At the end, before the collapse happens, uh, you get some solution. And that solution, the sparsity level, is affected by, by the error tolerance that you choose for these um, self isolation uh, intermediate problems. And smaller is better. So it's, it suggests that in order to get the highest sparsity, it's best to choose a smaller epsilon. Of course, since this is in theory, in practice, you cannot make epsilon too small because there is numerical issues, right? But in theory, the smaller gives you the sparser at the end. Another thing that I want to discuss is uh, comparing this with uh, early stopping. Because, okay, everybody knows that early stopping is providing some kind of regularization. And here we are saying self distillation is also providing some kind of regularization. Is there a connection between the two? Are they similar? So um, although people use uh, the name of early stopping uh, in the field a lot, but I don't think there is a uh, concrete um, increased definition for it. So here maybe I first give a general definition for early stopping. I call it any procedure that cuts convergence short of the optimal solution. And then there are different instances of this. For example, if you're using a numerical optimizer to minimize your loss, such as SGD, you could, for example, limit the number of iterations. Say, okay, after this many iterations, done. Or you can um, do early stopping by increasing your uh, training error loss uh, tolerance. So instead of like getting to near zero training error, you can stop at some epsilon that's slightly bigger. And that's also another uh, way of doing early stopping. But uh, the first definition is not applicable for an, uh, our analysis because you know here there is no numerical optimization. We are looking at the closed form, and our analysis is independent of how you parameterize the function. So there is no numerical optimization. So we can only look at the the second definition. So under the second definition, let's see what happened. Uh, in the yellow box, what I'm doing is again listing um, the solution after the first round of self distillation. It's, uh, we are not doing self distillation for early stopping, so it's just the first round. So you, you stop after uh, getting this solution. And if you play with the error tolerance uh, epsilon, it's going to affect you know, the Lagrange multiplier, the C0. So, uh, but nothing else in this form of solution. So uh, if we know what happens for like range of C0 from very small to very large, then early stopping will be somewhere in there. So it cannot be outside of this range, right? And uh, we can actually see that for both cases of uh, very large and very small uh, C0, um, this never is able to sparsify the matrix that we have in between. For example, if C0 is very large, then you uh, get this approximation in the first bullet point, which gives the matrix D which you know, is the initial sparsity pattern we have in D. And if C0 is very small, then actually this whole thing becomes close to identity, which is a full rank matrix. So actually you go against sparsity. So this is saying that with the early stopping, at best, you can maintain the original sparsity pattern. You cannot make it more sparse, but you can make it more dense, depending on you know, how you choose this epsilon. So it's not, um, it's not actually doing anything similar to self distillation and um, I uh, one thing also I think I can say about this is when your um, early stopping means that okay you choose a bigger epsilon so that means that uh, you choose a smaller c0 and for smaller c0 you get close to identity here so that's actually showing that it's doing the opposite of self distillation. So if you do early stopping, you end up with, uh, with uh, something that's even um, like less sparse than your, uh, than your initial uh, solution. So you're moving toward the identity matrix. All right, so now let's, uh, let's move on to some experiments on deep learning. I should say that our theory 
so far was only about this specific regression setup. Okay, so I'm not claiming that the, like um, the results that we have here uh, clearly carry over to deep learning, but there are some um, hope there that that you know could at least make us feel okay. Maybe this is providing some approximation to what's happening in in deep learning. And that connection was through, uh, again, wide neural networks and neural tangent kernels, because in the NTK regime, um, we know that the problem of deep learning is equivalent to a kernel regression. And kernel regression is what we study. So at least in that regime, these are related very closely. Uh, of course, as you move away from you know, wide networks, then this becomes a noisier and noisier approximation. The second thing I want to say is the beauty of self-isolation. So throughout the talk, we had to think about this regularization, underlying regularization, and its Green's function and all that. But in fact, you don't need to know any of those in order to uh, like use this kind of uh, regularization to get the effect of this regularization. All of that, you can think of it as a black box. So all the, as I said, all these biases of a deep neural network are now encoded into that kernel, at least in NTK regime. And we don't need to even know the kernel because what we show is that whatever that um, kernel or Green's function is, then we don't know. We just provide, you know, input, read the predictions, and then feed in these predictions again as new target values to the system. And it sparsifies that underlying uh, like regularizer, which we don't know and we don't see and we don't need to know. Okay, so I think that's very beautiful because we can claim that we are sparsifying uh, you know, the representation that is induced by that regularizer without even needing to know that regularizer. So is, that, is this clear? Because I think that's a very interesting uh, point I want to make sure. Or is there any questions so far in general? Because we have time. Uh, so uh, if not, I can move to some experimental results on deep learning. So we have uh, experimented with both VGG architecture and ResNet architecture. I only show the slide for ResNet, but for VGG, it's similar. And we have uh, used this for C410 and C4100. Uh, okay, ImageNet was, was not really an option for us because we wanted to do multiple rounds of self distillation It's not just one one-time training. It's like, for example, here, it's like 12 times retraining the model from scratch. On top of that, we wanted to get the variances, so we repeated each experiment uh, 10 times. So we couldn't really go beyond uh, C4100. Um, so what are these plots saying? So the left two plots um, are the train and test for C410, the right two are for C4100. The leftmost one, okay, maybe I, I start from uh, the, okay, uh, maybe I start from the second plot from the left. So that is C410, but the training accuracy. So this is the training accuracy with respect to the original labels, Y0. We see that the accuracy, training accuracy is going consistently down. And this is very consistent with a regularization viewpoint uh, because as we increase the regularization effect, amplify the regularization effect, uh, we know that it's limiting the ways that you can fit your train data. So we expect the training to, uh, you know, get the training uh, accuracy to get worse. Now let's look at the uh, leftmost plot, which is the test accuracy. We see that uh, up to, I think, uh, three rounds of self distillation In each round, we are able to benefit from this regularization. Uh, each time it amplifies it a little bit. But after about three rounds, it becomes too much. We start to over-regularize because this process just keeps amplifying the regularization forever, right? Um, so at some point, you start to over-regularize and then you see a decline of performance in the test uh, accuracy. And then on the two right plots, it's very similar uh, trend. It's C4 100 data set, but uh, the trends are quite similar. You can see that the training accuracy, which is on the rightmost plot, is declining, which is not surprising. They're very uh, well aligned with the theory. And also, the test accuracy is increasing. So I think you get the peak about uh, 
like maybe after 10 iterations, but after 10 iterations, it starts to decline. Now, um, one thing I need to say here is that people had observed that self-distillation, empirically had observed that self-distillation improves uh, test performance by running it um, for one or two rounds. But here, I think we did it for a longer uh, window and we can even see this uh, decline thing because I think based on previous results where it just showed okay you improve for the first one or two rounds you don't know what happens after that does it saturate uh, you get a flat curve after that or it starts to decline but here we show that it declined and we know now why it declines because it's a uh, over regularization All right so uh, we are getting close to the end of the talk, so maybe I can talk about some of the open problems here um, that can be pursued uh, by anyone interested. I categorize to applied and theoretical. So from applied uh, side, there is actually a very important direction to uh, pursue, and that is whether we can use uh, this understanding that now we have based on this uh, theory. We know that what happens, we know how it's regular, how self-isolation is regularizing and what is exactly that regularization for. It's, uh, you know, gradually sparsifying the, the matrix that we discussed. So whether we can use this understanding to develop, uh, construct new efficient algorithms that can achieve similar regularization effect, but, you know, more efficiently because it's, it's like insane. You want to uh, do self isolation for 10 rounds on a big model. I mean, that's, uh, that's not possible, right? It's not interesting. People will not use it. Uh, but the hope is that maybe by just understanding this regularization, you can now use it more directly. Maybe um, somehow change your training loop and just in the first uh, cycle of training, you somehow enforce this regularization effect simultaneously. So you don't need to run the model multiple times. Uh, you don't need to run training multiple times from scratch. So I think that's very important direction. And then from theoretical uh, viewpoint, there are um, some, I, I think, um, interesting directions. One of them is extending this analysis to cross entropy loss. So the plots I showed for deep learning we're based on L2 loss, but in the main paper, we have plots also for cross entropy and cross entropy shows similar trend. Like uh, if you use a cross entropy loss, train the models with self isolation and cross entropy loss, you see similar trend that the training uh, accuracy goes down, test accuracy going up, but we don't have a theory why, why that happens. So extending the analysis to L, uh, from L2 to cross entropy is a, uh, very important because the cross entropy is what people uh, use more often. The other question is whether we can take this uh, analysis beyond the RKHS, which was the key setup. So the regularization that we studied here, you know, things uh, ended up being like a kernel regression problem. So it's uh, uh, like a problem at the end uh, of, you know, studying uh, reproducing uh, uh, Colonel Hitler space. Uh, that was a setup that you could prove all things, but uh, whether we can relax this a little bit, go beyond this and still show what happens with self isolation that's another interesting uh, direction for future study. Uh, with that, I uh, conclude the talk and uh, thank you again, everyone, for uh, being here and uh, attending the talk. If there are questions, uh, we have, I think, some time to discuss and answer questions.